Marginal Munazara. In this presentation, I will describe some of my ongoing work with 9th or 15th century manuscript witnesses of Qutb al-Din al-Kilani's Sharh, or commentary, on the Risalafi Adab al-Bath wal Munazara, or Treatise on the Protocol for Dialectical Inquiry and Disputation of Shams al-Din Samarqandi. Having edited al-Kilani's commentary, I am now gathering up and editing the many hundreds of marginal notations from the early witnesses, and I have prepared and analyzed a sample of nearly 200 glosses on al-Kilani's commentary on Asamarqandi's definition of dawaran, meaning causal concomitants. Under the aegis of the Impact Project at Oxford, I edited and translated the Grund text, Asamarqandi's Risala fi Adab al-Bath, two example lamata are here in blue, and al-Kilani's Sharh on that Risala, here in yellow. My task in Bonn at the Alexander von Humboldt Kolleg for Islamic and Intellectual History is to transcribe and collate the glosses and scolia here in green, jamming the margins of the 15 or so oldest witnesses I've been able to acquire. As Samarqandi's Risala, the discipline founding work, streamlining previous methods of dialectic into a potent new form, is short, concise, and divided into three parts. Part one on definitions, part two on the proper conduct of disputation, part three with three problems, masail, introduced by Asamarqandi for practice and illustration. Today we'll focus only on a single one of Asamarqandi's definitions, his definition for dawaran, or concomitants, that is, presumably causal concomitants. This definition follows the closely intertwined and overlapping definition of mulazima, or necessary implication, that is, implicative concomitants. Mulazima, as Samarqandi says, is when one judgment assertion, one hukum, is a necessitator of another. The first hukum assertion is the melzum, or implicans. The second is the lazim, or implicatum. Dawaran, he says, is the subordination, the tarattub, of something to something else which has a suitability for causality, suluh al either in existence, wujudan, or in non-existence, adaman, or in both together. He concludes, the first is the da'ir, the presumed concomitant effect, while the second is the madar, the concomitant cause. If I could quickly sum up these two definitions, mulazima is when one judgment assertion, called the melzum, is a necessitator of another, called the lazim, and dawaran is when something called the da'ir is made subordinate to something else called the madar, which is suitable for being the cause, or illa, of the da'ir. In mulazim implication, the malzum judgment necessitates the lazim judgment. In dawaran, the madar cause presumably causes the da'ir effect. Now, whereas the Samarqandi was a relatively famed polymath, Qutb al-Din al-Kilani continues to elude my digging into the sources and remains a nearly complete mystery apart from his attributed sharh of a Samarqandi's Rasala. Here are the insipid pages from four of the oldest manuscript witnesses. Now what does Al-Kilani do with the Samarqandi's definition of Dawaran? As we will see here in my color-coded Bodleian library witness, he has quite a lot to say. With regard to the first part of the definition, Al-Kilani does all of the following. He provides two primary and two subsidiary definitions with illustrative examples. He explains the first primary definition, a Samarqandis, in terms of uh, definition theory. Then he engages in the nother, the dialectical speculation regarding a Samarqandis definition by introducing a critique of it, maintaining that critique with three arguments against two potential rebuttals, and then asserting his uh, solution definition. Finally, he critiques and dismisses the second primary definition. As for the second part of a Samarqandi's definition of Dawaran, Al-Kilani engages mostly in exposition. First, he explains the three divisions, or Aqsam, of Dawaran, and then he explains certain fundamental similarities and differences between Dawaran and Mulazima. And finally, he expounds on further divisions of Dawaran. So here are the three 
definitions thus treated by al kilani There is a Samarqandis. Dawaran is subordination of something to something else, which has a suitability for causality. Critiqued because it does not exclude chance occurrences. Ittifaqiyat. There is a second definition of unstated provenance. Dawaran is subordination of the effect to something in existence time after time. Critiqued because it excludes Dawaran Adami, concomitants qualified by non-existence. And there is al kilanis asserted solution definition. Dawaran is subordination of the effect to something which has a suitability for causality time after time. Now for the glosses. First, we should note that numerous intriguing details have begun to emerge, even from this relatively small sampling. Signs, for example, that some glosses were copied from exemplars, while others were probably dictated. Glosses which appear to represent individual voices, single, uniquely occurring argumentative glosses, tackling the Grundtext or commentary, and fuller curricular pictures of, for example, which dictionaries were most common, the Sahah of al-Jawhari being especially prominent, and which philosophers, theologians, and jurists were being read by the early scholars of Adab al-Bath. In just our sampling of glosses, we find three frequently cited and thus presumably key references for the Adab al-Bath at this time, Hussam Kati, Bihishti, and someone referred to as Maulana. Hussam al-Din al-Kati is known for his commentaries on al-Abhari's Isaroji, and the Sakaki's uh, Miftah al ulum However, and this is exciting, his, uh, these glosses attributed to him are specific to the Grun text and so appear to constitute a previously unrecorded, possibly no longer extant, commentary emerging piecemeal from the margins. Ala Adin al Bihishti's commentary on the Rasala is known and extant and matches with the glosses attributed to him but we may now probably confirm that his commentary is older than al kilanis and probably the first. And as for the simple honorific Maulana, my guess based on these and other glosses is that he is the famed Mullah Fanari, Shams al-Din Muhammad ibn al-Fanari, Sheikh al-Islam, and author of commentaries on al-Abhari's Isa Ghuji and uh, al-Katibi's Shamsiya, among other works. Again, his attributed comments are specific to this new dialectical discipline and so appear to constitute another work or works previously unrecorded and no longer extant in full compilation. What is most important, however, is the register of textual dialectical engagement in these glosses. To be certain, the greater bulk of glosses are expository, but whoever they were, and no matter whether conveying argumentative material from elsewhere or formulating it themselves, the glossators did not hesitate to engage argumentatively. They justified and objected and critiqued and offered up their own solutions. Now, in the Mebsut version of this presentation, what you're seeing is the Mukhtasar, I had planned to go into some detail with regard to my analyses of gloss functions. Instead, I can only mention that our glosses all on Al-Kilani's treatment of the definition of Dawaran, were culled from 13 early 9th or 15th century manuscripts. They were collated and edited, and are an impressive 192 in number. The great bulk are expository in nature, though some 30 glosses, 14% of the total, are argumentative. I'll skip quickly through the breakdown. Expository glosses were either supplementing, uh, most of these uh, supplying illustrative examples. Or they explained uh, and built upon the commentary, elucidating nuances of terms and concepts, illustrations, approaches, etc. Or they identified elements or mapped them to each other. Most interesting for us, of course, are the 30 argumentative glosses. These are where the ongoing discourse lives, the discipline's evolution, already manifest in al kilanis very argumentative commentary, is seen here in fluid, unreviewed action. It is more raw. It is where the teacher glossator, or eminent reader, or one suspects even the aspiring student, unhesitatingly, though most always with precision, 
engages with the commentator's assertions and arguments, churning up the margins with freshly formulated justifications and critiques, unique insights, and novel solutions. There are glosses wherein the glossator either critiques al kilanis position or defends it or defends his own position, as you see here. And there are glosses wherein the glossator jumps straight into al kilanis own nother sequence, either rebutting or supporting his hypothetical opponent or supporting or rebutting al kilani himself. Now, I would like to close by examining a few, uh, select few of the argumentative glosses so as to provide a hint of their register, scope, and detail. First is an example of the glossator jumping in on al kilanis nother sequence, rebutting, in this case, his hypothetical opponent. Now, at this point in the commentary, al kilani has criticized al-Samarqandi's definition of dawaran for not excluding chance occurrences, ittifaqiyat, like digging a hole in some spot and finding treasure, and proposed the solution of appending time after time to the definition. He then introduces a hypothetical objection that such is unnecessary, since subordination of something, taratu bishay, in customary usage, is already only applied to what is perpetual or most of the time, not what occurs just once. Adding time after time would be redundant. Here, the glossator interjects, saying, I say the overall proper response is that it be said that taratub, subordination, in customary linguistic usage, is the actualization of something upon the actualization of something else, no matter whether at all times, or most of the time, or otherwise. And when taratub is mentioned, but what is intended by it, in fact, is actualization at all times, or most of the time, then it is of uh, that sort of thing of uh, stating the general while intending the particular, without a contextual indicant, or qarina, providing indication for the particular intention. And such is not allowed because the general does not provide indication for the particular in any one of the three modes of indication. Now here's an example of a glossator relating an incorrect critique of al kilani solution, then rebutting it. This particular gloss occurs in no less than seven of the witnesses surveyed. Here you see the two oldest. And at this point in the commentary, al kilani critiques the second definition of dawaran earlier introduced, the subordination, tarattub, of the effect to something in existence, time after time, by pointing out it excludes dawaran adami, or dawaran qualified by non-existence. Our gloss in connection to this argument reads, It is not said in response to this. Here what is intended by existence, wujud, is occurrence, wuqu'a. So it is more general than the occurrence of existence or non-existence. Because we ourselves say that subordination, tarattub, is occurrence, and there is no meaning to occurrence in the occurrence. In other words, if in the second definition, tarattub al-athar ala shay, fil wujud marratan ba'da ukhra, we equate both tarattub and wujud with wuqu'a. We end up with the meaningless phrase wuqul athar ala shay fil wuqu'a, the occurrence of the effect to something in the occurrence. Notably, this gloss is attributed to Maulana uh, in four of our witnesses and to a sharh al fusul in another, and an interconnected gloss in yet another witness is attributed to Maulana Shamsuddin. And in this last example, the glossators introduce a dialectical nother sequence with regard to al kilanis illustrative example. Here, al kilani has described the second type of dawaran, wherein the madar is a madar to the da'ir in non-existence, not in existence, as life is to knowledge. That is, whatever thing has knowledge must have life, though it does not follow that whatever has life has knowledge. Two glossators here insert a dialectical nother sequence attributed to uh, Maulana. But this remains open to speculation, he says, since we do not concede the absence of realization of knowledge in a form in which life is realized, because every living thing is a knowing thing by immediate necessity. 
But it is possible to respond to this by saying that what is intended here by knowledge is the knowledge of universals. So it is not present in every living thing, since it is not found in non-articulate animals. Certainly, for some decades now, the false paradigm of post-classical decline and of a parroting or regurgitating commentary tradition has been soundly dismissed. A closing point I'd like to make is that we should recognize, in addition to the enormous task that remains in editing and studying the core post-classical works and their collected commentaries and glosses, there is yet another layer in parallel to and intertwined with all that. I'm speaking of the extant but hitherto uncompiled, almost always unedited, marginal scolia and glosses. Why are these important? They provide us a true, in a way, documentary understanding of how and with which complementary texts and teachers and with which degree of scholastic engagement and, rarely, in what societal and institutional contexts these core post-classical works and commentaries were read and copied and studied. Besides being enormously useful in helping us navigate these texts and in the way that their authors, students, and copyists navigated them, they offer raw glimpses unedited snapshots of a discipline in evolution. Thank you.